As for Joe disappearing, um, yeah, I mean, this is very convenient to the Harris campaign because um, she needs to distance herself uh, as vice president from the disasters of the Biden-Harris administration, um, you know, the economy, the um, inflation pressures that people are feeling, and also the 10 to 20 million illegal migrants that have flooded over the border. Um, and, uh, you know, among them, murderers, rapists, and terrorists. And the American people uh, in every corner of this country where these illegal migrants have been flown into by the administration to, um, you know, pretend that there's no overcrowding issue at the border, um, every town and, and city in this country is affected. And we saw that in the Springfield, Ohio dramas that Donald Trump quite cleverly brought to the fore um, when he talked about eating the cats and eating the dogs um, or eating the pets. So I think that the media, of course, is complicit with um, most of them, with uh, the Democrats, I call them the Democrats' handmaidens. So they will uh, do whatever helps the Harris campaign, and that is just to disappear Joe Biden, who'd become so unpopular um, with the American people that um, there was no way that he would win the election, which I assume is really why they um, ousted him from re-election. Um, he had no chance of winning and uh, Donald Trump was uh, doing very well in the polls. Um, and I think Donald Trump's actually regained uh, the momentum he had against Joe Biden and has successfully tied Kamala Harris to um, the disasters of uh, the Biden-Harris administration, um, but also she herself has been a really dud candidate, so um, she hasn't been able to rescue the situation. So that's, and, and the thing about Joe Biden is that he is still president. Um, he's president until January 20 of next year, and uh, there's a lot of serious problems happening in the world, um, but he doesn't seem to be in control. So when um, Israel just recently uh, fired, um, you know, started attacking Iran, um, which is a pretty big deal. There was no situation room for Joe Biden. He was holing out in his home in Delaware, as he often does. Um, and there was nothing from Kamala Harris. There was just silence. There was just a statement saying, well, you know, good luck to Israel, I guess. Um, so they're not behaving as a proper administration. And the cabal that controlled uh, Joe Biden and will control Kamala Harris. I guess they're the ones in control. Yeah. So how do you understand the successful removal of Joe Biden? I, he, he was president. I presume he could have said no, but he didn't. Like, how are we to understand the fact that he was president one day and and the presidential candidate one day and then not the next. I mean, how much of that do you think is, is, let's say, the reality of his cognitive decline, which we still know really nothing about, as far as I can tell? It seemed so self-evident that it was undeniable, but I'm not even sure what to make of that, given the evidence that the Democrats also potentially concluded that Biden was unelectable. And that was partly because of the evidence of his cognitive decline. But what do we make of the fact that he was so unceremoniously dumped? I mean, that seems to me to indicate that the sense that there are a multitude of forces operating behind the scenes, so to speak, is accurate. But what do you make of that? You know, it was evident, as you say, that Joe Biden had cognitive problems from, um, you know, it, it, I was in Iowa and New Hampshire in the uh, 2020 election earlier that year, and it, it was clear then to everybody in a room that saw him struggling to read just regular stump speeches from a teleprompter in a small town hall. Um, but he was uh, protected, his cognitive issues were covered up, but what what a weapon to have to wield over the head of a president to control him if he didn't do what you wanted. And so I just felt, you know, every time he had to go out and do a big set piece like the State of the Union um, or, 
you know, a G20 meeting or something. Um, he performed okay. You know, everyone was watching him, expecting him to stumble and uh, blather, but he actually seemed quite cogent. So his cognitive problems seemed to be intermittent and maybe, um, you know, they're related to, he had some brain an- aneurysms in the 1980s and brain surgery. Um, that may be a, a factor, but he, he certainly seems to have uh, and still has um, times where he is compass mentis. Um, and I don't know whether that can be controlled, but they seem to be able to control it, the timing of it for these big set pieces. And yet when he did that debate against Donald Trump, it was as if he was let go out without a safety net, without a tightrope, without whatever drugs that they normally gave him. He was uh, just left um, just dead desolate. You know, he was there on the stage, um, blank-eyed, unable to form sentences. Um, He was dead man walking. So if you wanted to get rid of him, um, that would be the way to do it. I don't know if that was deliberate or if it was an accident, but, you know, if you were the people around him and you saw him in that state before he was going onto that stage that night against Donald Trump with no notes and no teleprompter, um, surely you would have staged an intervention and said, oh, he's got COVID or something um, and stopped him going out there. So they let him go out there and destroy himself. Um, and then... Um, he, for a couple of weeks, it seemed that he would hang on. And I had some insight into the people in the background around his family and they were digging in. There was no way they were going to, um, uh, bail out. He was insisting that he was going to stay and Hunter wanted him to stay and Jill, Dr. Jill wanted him to stay. Um, but, uh, he didn't. And the reason he didn't was because, um, the donors, uh, about a week or so after the debate rallied around and just said there is no way that they were going to support the Democratic Party if Joe was the candidate. And what we found out, um, about that in, uh, actually in an article in the New York Times on September 24th was that um, Kamala Harris was part of that because uh, one of her best friends is Lorene Jobs, the widow of Steve Jobs. She's a billionaire, the richest woman in America. And she, uh, according to the New York Times, got her um, staff member who used to work for Barack Obama to do some focus group polling, which found that there was no way that Joe Biden could win the election. And she circulated that damaging information around the other Democrat donors. And after that, they put their foot down and said, Joe has to go. Um, Now, I don't think Joe Biden knew that until that New York Times article came out, because straight after that article, uh, he started um, bigfooting Kamala Harris and doing her damage. Um, There were two particular incidents that were notable. One was that um, she had picked a fight with uh, Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, over his hurricane preparation, saying that he'd ignored a phone call from her. Uh, he came back, uh, you know. So it was a big to-do. And uh, suddenly Joe Biden pops up on camera and says, oh, you know, Ron DeSantis is a great guy. We have nothing but good relations. He's talked to me about the hurricane and, you know, he's very competent and everything's fine. So that was really undermining Kamala Harris in a very obvious and embarrassing way uh, in real time. Time. And then there was another occasion around that time, which was um, Kamala Harris was on stage in Detroit. All the network cameras were on her. And suddenly Joe Biden strolls into the press room in the White House, where he has never been in his entire presidency, um, and and decides to take a press conference. And he didn't really have much to say um, other than that he and Kamala were locked at the hip. They were singing from the same uh, song sheet. They were on the same page. Um, and I guess he also wanted to make sure that Kamala didn't, she was just about to take credit for the um, ending of the uh impending longshoreman strike. So I guess he didn't want her to take credit for that. But I um, surmise from the timing of this that Joe Biden wasn't aware of Lorene Jobs' role in the donors pulling their support from him and knowing that Kamala Harris uh, regarded Lorene Jobs as family. She brought her into the White House when she was um, sworn in uh, and uh, as part of her family group. And I think probably Joe Biden figured out that Kamala had uh, sneakily uh, stabbed him in the back. And so he was paying her back in that way. And also telling her, don't you dare 
throw me under the bus. Don't you dare um, start distancing yourself from my achievements. Um, there was some um, background reporting that he was very angry and Dr. Jill Biden was very angry about um, a speech that Kamala had given in Pittsburgh about economics and she hadn't once mentioned Bidenomics or paid tribute to Joe Biden. Um, so uh, she's unable to distance herself and shortly after he bigfooted her like that in those two occasions, she made probably the biggest flaw mistake of her campaign, which was she went on air and she was asked, what would you do differently right, from right. Joe Biden? And she said, nothing. I can't think of a single thing. Yeah, right. Which was an amazing, I, I, I again, that just, my jaw has been open many times in the last multiple months. And that was certainly one of the events that caused that reaction. I mean, it, it stunned me at two levels. And the first was, while she had been striving to present herself as someone who had a new economic plan and to segregate herself from the Biden-Harris administration. And at minimum, you would have expected the Democrats to be cynical and competent enough to have prepared her to answer that question. Even if she believed, you know, even if she did believe that she would have done nothing different, she should have been wise enough to have something to say that was a little bit more detailed than that. It was as if the question hadn't occurred to her. You know, I think Joe Biden is, um, he's just a brilliant political strategist, a very cunning, um, Tammany Hall style guy. And I think he's outsmarted all the Democrat brains trust and certainly outsmarted Kamala Harris. Um, to him, uh, sure, he would like the Democrats to win. He doesn't like Donald Trump. But really, if uh, Kamala Harris didn't win, he then stands alone as the man who managed to vanquish uh, Donald Trump when Hillary Clinton and Kamala Harris couldn't. Uh, and also he's vindicated in um, the that he would have been a better candidate, that he should have been able right, to stay right, on. Right, right, right. Yeah, so at, at minimum, he's a man with seriously mixed motivations. And yeah. I suspect the same is true of his family. Okay, so two things. I'd like to turn our attention to, to Kamala. Um, what I don't know what to make of her. Um, I'm, I'm always, this is a terrible thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. Thank you.